Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk about this topic. And in fact, when I came across this ministry, because I was sent this invitation, I looked them up and I thought, wow, you know, like their ministry and their focus is so similar to mine. It just felt like an absolute yes from the moment that I heard from them because because our mission lines up and that is to to talk about healing and restoration and hope and those are some of the main themes that not only has God moved within those themes in my life but that I also want to share about so that's what I'm going to do tonight I'm just going to share with you a whole bunch of different topics and I know that we're all coming from different places there's everybody different ages different stages different walks of life different spaces in life some are single some are married some are widowed some are working some are students and some are just like me who are quarantined uh, because i traveled out of the country to drop off my daughter at franciscan university just three days ago i was there <clears throat> so now i'm in quarantine for 14 days and don't anybody tell my family, but it's kind of awesome. Um, it's, I mean, I wish I could give them all hugs, but I get to be in a beautiful space for two weeks. And I've decided I'm just going to use this as a retreat time for me. So this is a pleasure to be with you. This is like my main point of contact um, for the day. But I'm excited to talk about the themes of healing and restoration, because I think for all of us, this touches us. You know, we all have places within our hearts where we ache places where we experience physical pain, emotional pain, relationship pain. And we do wonder, I think a lot of the time, God, where are you in all this? Like, do you hear me? Are you going to heal me? And, and I love this question because it gets right to the heart, doesn't it? Like, God, can you really heal me? That's the title of this talk. And I, and I called it that because it's like, this is the question that rolls around in all of our minds. God, can you really heal me? Because we pray, and sometimes we feel like God comes through and answers our prayers, and sometimes it feels like he doesn't. And so from our limited perspective, often we're just left with assumptions. And that's what I want to kind of reframe tonight. Not only are we going to get into the topic of healing, and what does that look like in some of those categories that I mentioned, but also, what about our perspective? You know, what needs to happen there as far as our perspective and our relationship with God in regards to healing and how we view all of that. And so because our time is limited, I'm just going to dive right in and I'm going to tell a couple of stories and I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell jokes. I'm, I'm not going to start that way. We're just going to dive right in and hopefully and I'm going to cover a whole bunch of bases. And my prayer is that you will take what you need from this, that God will illuminate something that I say, something within your own story, within your own heart, that he wants to bring his light into that he wants to speak healing into and that he may even want to change your perspective in because it's not up to me to know and i can't possibly know what you're going through but i do know that we all come here with a variety of circumstances and a variety of pain and a variety of questions and different levels of faith and at the end of the day god loves us all and his heart for us is good so as you know i am a, a mother of three i'm married to jake um Jake also has some podcasts. You can check out that stuff later. But I grew up Catholic. I That meant I went to church and I did all the things because that's what my parents did. <laughs> that's what we did as a family. And it was just required as growing up in my family. But I didn't have a personal relationship with God. That wasn't something I, I really knew too much about. Although I could see it here and there, mostly what I saw it seemed from my judgmental little child heart was uh, people who weren't really engaged, who were kind of bored and were just going through the motions. When I was about 14 years old, I went to a conference and I was sitting in this huge group of about 500 teens and Peter Herbeck, a Catholic speaker was speaking and he just came up to me after his talk and he said, I don't know what is going on, but I just feel like God has great things for you. Can I pray with you? And I was no one to be noticed. I was just an awkward 14-year-old girl in a sea of people. I wasn't really excited to be there. I was an introvert. So I was just the most, yeah, unnoticeable person. But God saw me in the midst of that crowd. And when Peter prayed with me, I, I can't describe it other than I had a deep knowledge and understanding that God was really real and that he saw me that he saw what people, no one else could see. The brokenness, the pain, 
the guilt, the shame, all of the things that were going on in my heart. And he just, <laughs> he just filled me with a love that, that changed my whole life. And although, yes, I struggled, it wasn't like I never did anything bad ever again. Of course, there was a lot of wrestling that happened, but that moment just sealed something within me. It burned something in my heart that God really is real and that he's worth pursuing. And that was a big change for me in my life. And, and because of that, you know, it led me down a path of having to choose, making choices, a variety of choices. And there's many times that I think today, you know, and I, I'm brought to tears often by this thought that my life could have gone sideways a thousand times, although it went sideways probably 500 or 700 times. It could have gone so sideways. And I'm incredibly grateful to God that I am where I am. And because of his mercy and because of his healing in my life. And the, the fact that he has brought about healing in my life has brought me to this place where I feel so passionate about sharing this message with you. Because even though I grew up Catholic and even though I had all these great experiences and I went from there to Franciscan University, I studied theology and catechetics. I was in ministry for a while. I'd been traveling around doing evangelization. I got married and then everything hit the fan. And I was faced with this like empty space of like, I didn't know if God could really change my circumstances. And it scared me because my marriage felt like it was falling apart. And I just was faced with this deep question. Like, is this something that I'm just going to have to carry my whole life? Or is God really who he says he is? And it was as I entered into that journey, and I'm not going to get into the, all the details of that story because I want to tell you a hundred other stories, that God showed me that his desire is to make us whole and his desire is to be in deep relationship and union with us. And that there are a whole lot of things that he wants to change and heal and restore that he wants to blow apart our concepts of who we think he is and show us who he really is. And that is so much better than we could even fathom. I want to start with two stories because I feel like we land in between these two experiences and this is where we have our questions. So I have a friend, her name is Kristen. We were on a ministry team together. We went to Steubenville together and she has a family now. <clears throat> a couple years ago, her little two-year-old girl um, somehow got through the fence and fell into a pool and she drowned in that pool. When they found her, she was floating in the pool. They pulled her out. They called 911. The dad started giving her mouth to mouth and he kept recalling the words in scripture, little girl arise. He just kept saying that over and over again as he was giving her mouth to mouth. There happened to be a paramedic who was driving through when he got the call. He wasn't even supposed to be working, but he was close. So he came over there. He started all the things. The ambulance came. And when they got her in there, they had been working on her for half an hour. There was no heartbeat for 30 minutes. And they brought her to the hospital. And they thought that they had lost her until the doctor came out and said, we have a heartbeat. And this started something, a journey where immediately they were overjoyed and all of a sudden struck with incredible fear of like, what does this mean? You know, what does this mean? Like severe brain damage, like what is going on? Is she going to recover? Is she still going to survive? Long story short, <laughs> over the course of like, you know, I, I don't even know how long it was. I think it was like a few weeks. She's in the hospital. Everybody's praying, praying, praying. This little girl ends up walking out of the hospital with no damage to her brain. And she survives this incredible accident. And literally, God rose this little girl from the dead. We were, in some ways, you just go are you serious, God? Like, no, there has to be another explanation, you know, like maybe something else was going on. Maybe she did have a heartbeat. Maybe they didn't know. But we know because of our faith that God truly is a miracle working God. And I think for many of us, we think, well, maybe that was just 2000 years ago and those are just contained in the scriptures. But God, as he says in the scriptures, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still a healer. 
He is always a healer because that is his heart. He wants to restore and make whole and bring new life. That's just who he is. I want to share another story. My mom and dad, um, they're from Scotland. They moved to Canada <clears throat> just after they got married. Big adventure for them. And when they came here, started having children, you know, they had $500 in their pocket. They struggled through all the things, started having children. They had my, my sister, Karen, and my brother, Mark, just 14 months apart, those two. And then my brother, Sean, and then I was born. Um, and I was just three months old at the time. And my dad had taken my two brothers to work with him. And there was a terrible accident that happened. <clears throat> and my brother, Mark, ended up with a head injury because of the accident that occurred there. They rushed him to the hospital and he didn't make it. He was seven years old and he passed away that day. My parents were completely, as you can imagine, shattered. Their hearts were broken wide open. And as a parent, I was only three months old, so I don't remember this incredible tragedy for my family. I've only heard about it. I've seen pictures of him but I haven't experienced the tragedy firsthand like they did. They were completely shattered. And as my mom, you know, like went through the whole process of grieving, <clears throat> she ended up encountering a prayer group nearby. Um, just, it was just in uh, London, Ontario, actually, so close to where your ministry is. But she ended up connecting with a prayer group out of her deep sorrow. She chose to go to God with her grief. She always, she always had a very strong relationship with Our Lady. And so she just clung to Jesus through her grief and her sorrow. She experienced um, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which radically changed the course of her life. God became very real to her, and he began to heal her heart. And although that was incredibly painful, God has brought so much fruit out of that in her ability to care for other people who go through grief and sorrow, in her ability to just have this tender compassion that just pours out of her heart. And the question that I want to pose here in these two stories that I hold to you, is God still good in both? Is God not still good? Does he prefer one to the other? Because I think this is what we do. We often look at scenarios like that that happen in other people, but in regards to us personally. So we look at somebody else that God is blessing. And if we don't experience blessing, we start to set our, our arms out against God and say, you don't care about me as much as them. You aren't good here. And I want, these questions are so vitally important. Most people don't want to talk about this because it gets into the, the real stuff, the stuff that we're scared of inside. But this is where God wants to go because this is the places that matter to him the most. They're the places where we are so afraid and where we question, is God's heart good towards us? Does he care about us? And can we trust him? I think in regards to healing, those really are the questions, you know. God, can I trust you if you answer my prayer the way I want you to? And even if you don't, are you still good? So we're going to dive into all of that a little bit. I mean, these are big questions. Um, these are questions that, you know, you can't answer in 45 minutes or probably a lifetime. But what I want to do is I want to shed some light on certain areas of the healing process, and also what God says in scripture, so that it will illuminate places within us that God wants to heal and restore. So he can change our perspective so that we don't have to keep him at an arm's length and we can welcome him and his healing more deeply into our life. I think for many of us, we have this belief that we either um, like, God says, ask and you shall receive. So he should give us everything that we ask for. Or that we probably won't get anything good on this side of heaven. And we just need to walk around and carry our cross and suffer. <laughs> and, and I think those two perspectives, it's like this one or this one. But really, it's probably more of a both end. Because Jesus says, you will have struggle. You will experience hardship on this earth. And then he also says, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. You will have trouble but I have overcome the world. 
yes, there is a place for suffering and there is a place for redemptive suffering where our suffering and we can, as we offer that to Jesus, we can participate in the healing work and restoration of the rest of the world. We see this in the lives of the saints, most particularly where they continually offer their suffering, Mother Teresa and so many different saints that we see who just suffered so well, so valiantly. And we will never know until the end of time, until we come into the presence of God, please God what the impact of that kind of redemptive suffering when we offer it in united with Jesus in his suffering. And then there's this other part, you know, that I said where we think, well, God says, ask and you shall receive. And I'm asking, so, you know, give it to me. And yes, that's also true. You know, that's also true. And how do these go together? Well, we have to look at our relationship with God and also understand that our perspective isn't everything. We actually aren't God. Surprise. (laughs) We actually don't know everything. We actually can't see everything, even though we might think we understand. It's almost like we're looking at the back of a tapestry. We could see all the little ropes and strings and everything. It makes absolutely no sense. God is looking at the front. He can see the whole picture. He can see every detail. He knows what it all means because he created the entire world and he is working all things for good for those who love him. All things even the hardest things. How do we know this? Because Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, that was the most horrific thing ever. God's own son suffered, was tortured, died on the cross, a horrible, public, humiliating death. And then he rose again. And that whole thing, he shattered death. He shattered the fear of death because he provided new life for all of us to come to him, to be with him forever in heaven. Now that symbol of the cross and of the crucifix isn't something horrific. It's something beautiful, the most beautiful sign of love that the world will ever know. God can make all things new. And to be honest with you, I wear this little crucifix around my neck, excuse me, for a lot of reasons. But there are so many times that I just hold this crucifix and that is my thought. Jesus, you make all things new. And this is the sign of that, that you can take the most horrible things and turn it into something beautiful. But it may not always look what we, what we think it should look like or maybe what we want it to look like. And so that's where a perspective and a shift in our perspective, God wants to heal and restore as well. So let's just go back to the beginning. Like, why do we have to have so much suffering in the world? Why is that even a thing? You know, well, we know that Adam and Eve were in the garden. God, his whole desire was union with us. It was like an explosion of love from the heart of God in which we were created. He is love itself. He's not just like loving. He doesn't just love people where he sometimes loves. He is love itself. Every time you experience love, true love, real love, that is God himself, his very presence. And love always gives, it always donates, it always gives life, it's always self-gift and perfect receptivity at the same time. So he just explodes with love and creates, Adam and Eve creates us, creates us in his image of love. We were made to be in union with him. And that's where we see Adam and Eve at the very beginning. They're in the garden. They're walking with God in the cool of the day. I I would love that, wouldn't you? Be walking outside in your garden with God in the cool of the day. How amazing. Adam and Eve had this. You know, they had it. And many of us can look back and go, gosh, you guys blew it. You completely blew it. Why would you choose something else? And I think just even noticing that God gave them a choice that he created this beautiful garden and he said, you can eat of any of the tree, any trees in here. Not, not this one, just this one. But he was giving them a choice to say, you can trust me that I am going to give you everything good for you or you can go your own way because that's what love does, right? It lets you choose. God lets us choose even things that are bad for us. He permits it. You know, it wouldn't be love if I said to my husband, okay, you have two choices. You can marry me or you can marry me. (laughs) That, That isn't love, right? If he doesn't have a choice, like you want it to be a free, total faithful, fruitful choice. God gave Adam and Eve this choice. And what did they do? They blew it. They totally blew it. And we can look back on that and say, 
gosh, if I was there, I would not have made that choice. Well, I guarantee you, friends, you would have made that choice too. Because we do. We make that exact same choice. Every day we sin and choose something other than God. Every day. Most of us, multiple times a day. Multiple times a minute. <laughs> we are choosing not God. We are choosing something else. We lose our trust in him. And that's what happened. The enemy crept in and he just started whispering these lies, these questions that caused them to question the heart of God. He's like, is he holding something back from you? Why did he say you can't eat of that tree? And I feel like this is the stuff that goes on in our heart too. That story is not a distant story. It's our story. There's so many times where I've heard that voice in my heart. Is there really something wrong with this? I mean, it looks pretty good. Looks like that would satisfy me. It looks pretty fun. Why can't I do that? Why can't I have that? Well, the church says I shouldn't, or God says I shouldn't. You know, we go our own way. We think, well, I'm going to try it out because I need to know for myself. You know, God has given us everything good, and yet we still choose something else. This is the story of Adam and Eve. It's our story. When that happened, this massive rupture occurred. You know, and Adam and Eve could no longer be in the presence of God like that. They hid themselves because of shame and guilt. They couldn't be in the garden because that was the place of union. And they didn't have union with him anymore. There was this chasm because God's purity and holiness was so great that sin could not even enter into his presence. It, it just couldn't. Any kind of darkness could not even enter into his presence because he's so good. Adam and Eve would have just killed over dead if they had been in the presence of God. And we've seen that. We hear that in the Old Testament stories, you know, where even Moses is like, God, can I see your glory? Can I see your glory? And he says, no, Moses, you can't. You need to hide behind that rock when I pass by because you're going to die if you see me. I'm just pure goodness and love and light. And it would just, it would torture you because I'm too good, you know, because there's all these places within you that are broken and sinful and hurting. But as this rupture happened, what do we see throughout all of scripture is God's pursuit, pursuit, pursuit over and over again. He's like, I want to heal you. I want to restore you. I want to make all things new. And Jesus was the fulfillment of that promise. He was the fulfillment of the covenant that every time God said, you are my people, I am making a covenant with you and I will not abandon you. And then he sent Jesus as the ultimate fulfillment of that because only his son could bridge that gap, could heal that rupture and make a way for us to be back with him forever. That's the whole point of it all. The whole point of our Christian life isn't the removal of pain. It isn't just healing. It's deep union with God. That's the point of it all. It's so short-sighted for us to say, you know, can you heal my pain? When really, it's like, God, can you heal my sin, heal my heart, heal, heal, heal the chasm between us so that one day I can be with you forever, forever. But we often are so focused. It's so hard for us as human beings. God knows us. He's so merciful upon us. It's so hard for us to not get past this earthly life because here we are. We are in it every day. So I love this scripture in Isaiah 61. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, and to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. That scripture in Isaiah, we hear Jesus say it again in Luke. And basically he's saying, I'm the one. I'm the one they've been talking about this whole time. And I have come to heal you and to set you free. Amazing. Totally amazing. And what do we see in the life of Jesus? That's exactly what he does. He heals. He restores. He pursues. He goes after the lost one. He goes after the outcast and he's not afraid. He's totally unafraid of our brokenness and our wounds and our weakness and even death because he has power over it all to change it all. When we look through scripture, we see time and time again, 
God and his covenant with us. He's faithful over and over and over again. So no matter where we are unfaithful, where we fall apart, God is faithful. I just want to blast through a whole bunch of scriptures. And the reason why I'm doing this again is to reorient us in a, in a godly kingdom perspective, because most of us walk around with an earthly perspective. It's like, I can feel what I feel right now. I'm hurting. I don't know what to do. I'm lost in my life. And we get lost in a spiral of depression and despair and hopelessness. And the only way to pop out of that is to be empowered by the truth of God in scripture, to hear the truth and to lift our eyes out of this to the kingdom and say, God, what is your word about what's going on in my life? What is my life all about? It's all about him. It's all about experience this union with him because that will satisfy every single ache and longing that you have deep in your heart. Everything, everything that you are looking for will be fulfilled with him. And that isn't just in heaven. That's right now. That is right now. So I want to go through these scriptures. God is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. 1 Kings 8, 56. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise by which he spoke by Moses, his servant. James 1, 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Lamentations 3, 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. So great is your faithfulness. Exodus 34. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to pray to me, and I will hear you, and you will seek me, and you will find me, and when you seek me with all your heart. Isaiah 43, But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. John 16. I've said these things to you that in me, you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, this is just a few, just a few of the scriptures that we can look at and see over and over again, God just pouring out his love and his promise. This is our hope. You know, if we put our hope in things that are fading, our hope in like things that we want to go a certain way, our hope in politicians, our hope in, you know, our families, our hope in other people, other things, like we will constantly be left with, with disappointment constantly. But when we put our hope in a God who is faithful and steadfast, who is unwavering and who doesn't change, this is where we can feel secure and safe. And why do we go through this? Because we need to know that we can trust him. We can trust him that whether he says yes or no, that whether it turns out the way we want, that he is good and he wants good for you. He wants good for me, that he doesn't set out to harm us, that he is the giver of life, not the giver of death. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and this is what he has for us. There's a, a different way uh, that we need healing. And there's, I, I kind of broke it down into like physical healing, relational healing, inner healing, and healing from our sin. Physical healing is obviously sickness, disease, relational healing. That's any relationship that we have, friends, family, marriage, people we work with, teachers, you know, any, any kind of relationships we have. Inner healing is like our personal wounds, our hearts, our minds, our emotions, like stuff within our own stories that hasn't gone well. 
And then obviously our healing from sin, because we all have a sin problem, a massive sin problem. And God is merciful. And there's one thing I love, just side note, about the sacrament of reconciliation. It's also called the sacrament of healing. And there's been many times just knowing that for me has been a shift because sometimes I would just go there, rattle off sins. Now I go there with like, God, like this is a real struggle for me. Like all of these different things where I might be struggling in a relationship and I desire healing. This is where I need you. This is where I get grace. And this dispensation of, of like, of, of healing that can come through this wonderful sacrament. So I want to talk about physical healing. I told you one story already and we see all throughout scripture, there's multiple physical healings that happen. I wanted to tell you another one. Um, so my dad, when I was like 16 years old, he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's large cell lymphoma. And it came as a complete shock. He was in stage four already. It, it, it was advancing like really, really rapidly. And we went through, he was going through a series of tests like over and over and over again. And, and everywhere that they looked, there was cancer. It was like there was cancer in his lymph nodes and under his arm and in some of his other organs. And um, there was cancer in his blood and it was in his bone marrow. Like every time we prayed, like, God, don't let it be there. It was there, you know? And so for a 16 year old, I was like, why am I even praying? Like, what, why am I even talking to you about this? Like everything that I say, it's just the opposite. This is pointless. You know, this seems completely futile. And I think for many of us, we feel that way a lot in our prayer. It's like, why am I doing this if you're just going to do whatever you want anyway? But that's not how prayer works. You know, I remember this um, quote from uh, Anthony Hopkins, who was in Shadowlands. It was a movie from a long time ago, and he was playing the role of C.S. Lewis. And he just said, you know, I pray because not because I want to change God, but because prayer changes me, it changes us. And I think prayer, you know, no matter what the circumstances are, it draws us close because I said at the very beginning, God is about relationship, not just about the removal of pain. So when we pray and we come to him, we're learning dependence and trust. We have decisions to make in there where we can surrender. We can receive consolation from him. There's so many gifts that God has. And sometimes we just get hung up on the one thing, you know, but God has so much more for us. Anyway, back to my dad. So He's, he goes into the hospital because they wanted to take a closer look at all of these tumors. And when he was there, the doctor said, um, Mr. McGuire, like, you need to prepare your, your situation because you have three months left to live. Um, we just found a new clump of tumors. It is rapidly spread throughout your whole body. And there's really not much that we can do. So he was in this cancer clinic overnight. He was by himself and there was a little Bible next to his bed. And he, he wasn't much of a Bible reader. You know, he went to church on Sunday. He was a good faithful Catholic, but didn't have that personal encounter with God. Anyway, he didn't have anything else to read. So he picks up this little Bible and he, he reads a scripture about God's forgiveness. And he just personally felt like really touched by that. And then he flipped his Bible open again. And it was the story of the leper and the healing of the leper. And he put the Bible down on his chest and he said, God, if it's your will, I ask that you would take away the spirit of cancer and replace it with good health. <clears throat> well, my dad said he had never asked for anything for himself before because he didn't feel worthy to ask God. He prayed for other people. You know, he prayed for all kinds of things, but not for himself. It was like the first real simple prayer of asking God. And then at that moment, he felt this incredible energy and power just rushed through his body, like through his eye sockets, through his whole entire body. My dad's a very logical man. So for him to even say this was like, what is going on? And he, it was so intense that he opens up his eyes and everything stops. He closes his eyes, nothing happens. He opens his eyes again. And he was just like, what has happened to me? He felt like his whole body was shaking on the bed. And then came this joy that just welled up. He starts laughing. He called us that night. And I remember picking up the phone. And all I heard was laughter on the other line. I was like, what is going on? It's just this joy. He's like, people are going to think I'm crazy in here. I don't know what is going on, but something has happened to me. He went in for his test the next morning because they were going to take a scan get a closer look at all the tumors. And they came back and they said, Mr. McGuire, that was the most boring three hours of our life because there's nothing there anymore. All of it was gone. His whole body was healed of cancer that day. God is a God of miracles, friends. Like my dad is next door, alive and well. And um, 
yeah, that actually happened. And I can tell you because I was there. You know, I, I know all the data. There is no other explanation for this. And I know that like in our minds, we, most of us want to go, well, I mean, maybe something else, maybe, you know, no, there's no power of positive thinking that is going to take tumors out of your body like that. Only one can do that. That's Jesus. And he's the healer. Now, does he heal everybody? Like, why my dad? I don't know. I don't know. You know, my dear friend, Sister Miriam, her dad passed away from cancer. Why, why didn't he heal him the same way? You know, that many of you that are listening right now, you're like, but he didn't heal this person. He didn't heal me. And maybe, maybe you have cancer and you're sitting there right now and you're wondering these questions. I don't know why God sometimes does and sometimes doesn't. What I do know is that if he healed everybody of everything that we asked him for, that would be called heaven because that's what happens in heaven, that all our sorrow, all our pain, all our tears are washed away. We're not in heaven. So some, most of the time we are experiencing suffering and death and sorrow. This, this is the fall that happened to all of us. This is the effects of the fall. But God, sometimes it is, I don't know why, but he just wants to show us that he is who he says he is, that he's trustworthy and he performs these miracles. And we should always come to him and ask, always expecting, maybe not that he's going to do what we ask, but he's going to do what is best that he's going to, even if something horrible happens, that he's going to bring something good out of it, that he can change us, that he can heal our hearts, that when we lose someone, that they, they can be prayer warriors for us in heaven, that we can learn compassion and sympathy for, for others, that we know then how to be a caregiver for those who are in need and who are in sorrow this is such a complicated question. There's no straight answer for it. Why does he heal some and not others? I don't know. I'm going to have that question. Hopefully when I see him at the end of my days, I hope I'm going to see him and be able to ask all these questions. But what I do know is that God is a miracle working God. He has the power to heal and that he wants to do what is best for us. The goal isn't the removal of pain. It's union with him. Now, I've experienced a lot of different kinds of suffering in my own life, emotional suffering, you know, mental illness suffering with depression and anxiety at, at times of my life, relationship suffering, marriage suffering, you know, suffering as a parent that when you worry about your kids and they make stupid decisions, um, there's all different kinds of suffering that I've experienced in my life, other sufferings that I would never tell anybody. And in those sufferings, some of them have been healed and some of them haven't but every one of them, I have had the opportunity to either draw really close to God or to push him away. And there has been times that I've pushed him away. You know, I think we all do at times. But when I have, you know, just let go and surrendered to him, I'm able to experience something totally different. Now I'm not in my pain alone. Now I have the one who saves who is walking with me in my pain, who can comfort me, who can speak the truth to me, who can hold me, you know, who can give me hope in the midst of all of that. And that's where my relationship with him has really grown is in those times of suffering. You know, that's when the rubber meets the road, you know, are we going to be faithful to Jesus? And are we going to trust in his promises no matter what? And we hear, you know, Paul in the scriptures, he's like, no matter what, no matter what, like whether I have, whether it's feast or famine, you know, whether I'm in prison or I'm free, like I have learned that God is enough for me in all circumstances. And he wants that for you. And he wants that for me, that he would be enough for us in all circumstances, no matter what they are. I want to touch on relationships because I think this is an important piece. We, we struggle here tremendously. Um, and usually there's so much, so much emotion and unforgiveness and pain and harboring of resentment that can happen in relationships for a variety of reasons. And, and I, I just want to say about that, that, that forgiveness is so vitally important. Like we, we know from, I'm sure you've all heard this, like there's scientific studies that people who harbor unforgiveness and anger, they suffer, you know, more physically. Like it comes out in your body. It comes out in other pain and suffering. Like our hearts are meant to be whole and our hearts are meant to be free. 
and harboring resentment and unforgiveness can paralyze us and destroy, you know, not only more relationships and our own hearts because they harden, but also, you know, our physical selves start to suffer as well. Often we can get stuck when we don't feel like we can reconcile with a person directly. And I've had this situation in my life. I, I really struggled with my brother when we were growing up. And, and I mean really struggled, like not normal <laughs> sibling relationships, but there was some really unhealthy, scary um, behaviors that were going on in this relationship. And, and I had to, you know, journey through that without him coming and saying, I'm so sorry, you know, let's have a talk about it. And, and that's a big question. It's like, how do I move through a relationship that has been broken if I can't talk to the person and they won't apologize to me because I wasn't wrong. <laughs> I think we all feel that, but really, I mean, there's many situations where we're like, I, I wasn't wrong. You know, if we are, we have the power to go and extend forgiveness and we need to get over ourselves. It's just plain and simple. If we're a follower of Jesus, then we need to be humble and we need to go and say, I've wronged you. I'm sorry. But what about when we aren't the one who has done that? I've learned that I can still be free. That that conversation actually, although wonderful, if it could happen, it doesn't need to happen for freedom to occur. That there's so much work that I can do, whether in my relationship with God, with a counselor that I trust who, you know, has a Christian perspective on things, with healing groups, with friends and community that can help bring healing, with other, you know, for me, it was even other godly men in my life who were able to just heal that wound of a brother by just being a good spiritual brother to me. God wants to heal relationships. There are things that we should have got or maybe that we shouldn't have got in our relationships that cause wounds. And in those spaces where we didn't get what we needed, God wants to send not only his presence and his healing into that, but also he wants to send other people to help bring healing there. And it might not just be one person. It might be a variety of people who show you the face of God, the father, that where we have father wounds, and I think probably most of us do, even if they were a great dad, even if they were a great father, because our parents reflect the face of God, that he wants to show us his fatherhood through other people that reveal the face of the father. And I think we can look for that. We can pray for that, for God to send us spiritual relationships. And also that we can be that for other people, that we can, we can also offer that like spiritual friendship and you know, sisterhood and brotherhood and motherhood and fatherhood to those around us. I think as a community of relationships, it's so important that we work on our own healing for us, but also so that we can be a good friend, a good mom, a good sister. We can look outwards and say, if they would just change and if they would just change and yes, gosh, so many people should change, but no one more important than me <laughs> because I have control over me and what I do. And we, we know the stories of so many people. We've all heard people who have heroically loved and forgiven and gotten past incredible wounds, you know, and they have been a gift to the world and to those around them. Only This can only happen through grace. And all of us need this grace of God. All of us need his mercy and his power so that we're not moving just in the human and in the natural, that we're moving supernaturally through these relationships and sorrows. God can give us the strength and the grace to do things that are far beyond our capacity. I've had relationships in my life that were so painful that I thought this will never heal. This will never be restored, even within my marriage. And I've said that so many times in my head, this, this will never change. This will never, whatever, whatever it might be, these catastrophic statements. And when I have brought it to God, and I'm talking about, it could be years that I've brought it to God. These aren't like quick moments. Okay. I don't want to give an illusion like, oh yeah, healing is just so easy. Just give it to God. Okay. It's a process, a journeying of giving it to God again, 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 Lord, change me, Lord, heal me. Lord, restore me. This pain here that I feel, this rejection that I feel from this relationship, God, heal me there. Let me know that I belong to you, that you are my healer, that you are the one who sees me, that, that I'm important to you, that my value is in you, not in other people. These are the types of relational conversations that we need to have with God because he truly is the one that can heal all of these places in us that no one else can heal. 
yes, conversations are good and there can be healing elements to those, but ultimately we need the grace and healing power of God to heal our hearts and relationships so that we don't shut down, so that we don't grow cold. We want to be free to love, right? This is the deepest desire of our hearts. We want to love and be loved. We want to be seen. We want to be known for who we are and who can do that best. The only one who can do it perfectly is God. So we can never be fully fulfilled by a relationship in our life. There's no spouse, no matter how great they are, no friend, no teacher, no parent who is going to love us perfectly. There will be faults and there will be wounds that happen in every single relationship. You know, but if we're able to continue to open our heart to God and to have him heal those places and fill in all the gaps where we experience pain, tremendous things can happen. Things beyond your wildest imagination. We only have control. I mean, I say that word control really loosely. <laughs> like we have decisions that we can make, you know, and, and in more recent years of my life, I have seen over and over again that when I choose to go to counseling, when I choose to have friends hold me accountable and, and share my burdens and let them pray with me. And I'm not just being self-reliant when I lean into God and into my faith community, that things change things change that I never think could have changed before. Um, the inner healing path. I just want to talk about that um, briefly because we're running out of time. Your story really matters. You have a story. For many of us, I think we say sometimes like, ah, you know, what's in the past in the past. We just got to get over it. You know, people have it worse off than, than I did. It's true. It's true totally true like there's every, there's always somebody that has it worse off than you worse off than me at the same time god cares about you he cares about your story and maybe something that was hard for you it might be hard for somebody else but it's hard for you and he knows that his heart is so attentive to you to your needs to your hopes that have been shattered to to things in your story like parent wounds and teacher wounds and things that when you were little that you you had no control over he is attentive to those things he sees those things and they matter to him they matter to him no matter how small and insignificant they might seem and and i used to have this feeling like well if i go there you know with some of my wounds it might seem like i'm ungrateful like god's really given me a lot of good things you know and i remember just feeling in my prayer one day god saying heather I want to heal you all the way. Will you let me? Will you let me heal you into those places? It's not, it's not a lack of gratitude, but I just, I just want to know that you matter to me. And so as I was able to open up these parts, well, my goodness, I realized I had a lot more in there than I was willing to admit to myself. It's amazing how we shelter ourselves from the pain of our own story often, because it's scary. It's hard to go in there. And at the end of the day, I think most of us wonder if I open up this can of worms, is God really going to show up for me? He is going to show up for you. He is all about you. His heart is for you. And he has said all throughout scripture over and over and over again, I will never leave you and abandon you. I've sent my spirit to be with you as an advocate. You are mine. And this is where we need to like get into scripture and get into the word and memorize it and write it down and stick it on our bathroom mirror, whatever we need to do to spend time in the word of God, to be reminded of the truth that he cares so deeply and he will never, ever abandon us. That in these places of sorrow where it doesn't even make sense anymore, how we could ever get out of this, that he has the power to make all things new. It doesn't have to make sense to us. For him to work miracles. There's so many other stories that I feel like I could share with you. And I bet you that you all could share stories with me too. You know, it's not like I'm some great, like, whoa, like, look at all of this. Like, we all have seen God move in different ways. And we all have experienced like life shattering situations. And I just want to keep coming back to this, this whole idea of like, the point in our life here on earth is union with God. Our sin problem, we need the healing of God there. This is what has ruptured our relationship with him. 
other people's sin problems affect us. Our sin problem affects other people. It's just this domino effect of wounded people will wound people, you know? So the more that we experience healing in our life and become a conduit of the healing power of God in other people's lives, and we become a witness of healing that God really can heal and restore, we are going to make the world a better place, a more loving place, a more human place. And I believe that this, that this can happen. You know, we look around and we see all kinds of destruction, but friends, like that's not the truth because God says that the light is brighter than the darkness. The, you know, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And right now I feel like we're all being incredibly duped that the darkness is everywhere. And where is the light? We're all like, where is the light? That's just not the truth. You know, the perspective is skewed because we're looking at social media and the news and we're being bombarded with like every single tragedy that is happening at real time in the world from a number of different sources all throughout our day. We are not made for that. We need an anchor and that anchor is Jesus. He is the one that when we place our hope in him, that he is going to anchor us through every storm when he is the light of the world, but he's our light as well, that he's a light in our darkness, it is going to change our perspective on the world. There are so many beautiful things that are happening. This is happening. There's beautiful ministries that are happening. God is at work all across the world. I'm hearing miracle stories. I'm hearing movements of God. I'm hearing young people just set on fire with the love of God. I'm hearing about, you know, people serving the poor and and feeding the homeless and all of these different things like people are helping and serving and loving and pouring out their lives should this not be where our focus is you know that even that that god wants to heal and restore where our focus lands that our focus would be on jesus and so i just want to pray with you right now as we wrap this up a little bit and I just want to pray for all of you and just wherever God has you for his healing and um, just for that perspective. So if you would just join me in prayer and whatever this looks like for you, you can open your hands, close your eyes, bow your head, get on your knees, whatever. I just want to invite you to create a quiet moment just for God. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you say that where two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are. And you don't lie. So we trust you that you are here, right here, with each of us. And we welcome you. We just welcome your presence, Lord. That wherever each of these people are, in their home or together or uh, wherever they might be, Lord, that your presence would be there that you would pour out your love upon them, Lord, that you would come with your spirit. I just pray, Lord, that you know each person's story and you know our pain, and I ask that you would come, Lord, now with your light into the darkness, into the places of hurt and shame, sorrow, to the places where we are broken, where our bodies need healing where our hearts need healing, where our minds, our emotions, our relationships. I pray, Lord, that you would come with your healing power as each of us, Lord, sit here with our own intentions. You alone know what they are. I pray that you would come with your healing touch and your light into every person's heart and area where they are asking you for healing, Lord that your presence would be there, that you would bring healing and restoration, that you would be hope where there is despair. We just come against despair in your name, Jesus. And I ask that you would bring freedom for those who are in bondage to certain sin, Lord, that they just can't get out of, especially in the areas of addiction, sexual addiction, alcohol, drugs. I pray, Lord, that you would come and bring your freedom for those who are stuck in cycles of jealousy and comparison, that they miss the good gifts that you have for them because they're constantly looking at what they don't have and what others have. I pray, Lord, that you would come and bring healing, that you would just let the scales fall from their eyes and that they could see your goodness and your blessing and your generosity in their life. Lord, I pray for relationships, especially between parents and children. 
pray for relationships with spouses and friends, teachers, coworkers, priests. I ask, Lord, that you would come and bring your healing into these relationships, especially where they seem the most lost, that you would soften hearts, bring clarity and understanding and peace. Lord, that you would teach us how to walk the path with you into healing, that there is only one way to new life, and that is through the cross. So Lord, that you would give us the grace and the strength to walk a, a path of suffering that leads to new life, and that you would be there to accompany us. I just pray, Lord, for every ache that we have in our heart, only you know. You are the fulfillment of everything that we're longing for, Jesus. So I ask that even just right now, that this night would set us off on just a deeper relationship with you as our friend, as our king, as our savior, that we would know the power that you have as our savior. And I just pray for a deep surrender within all of us, Lord, that we could surrender our lives to you so that you could do what you want and make a gift of us to the world, that you would set our hearts on fire, that as we heal, that we would be healers with your power moving through us, Lord. I just entrust all of these prayers to you, Jesus, and I pray for those who are needing accompaniment, that you would send people to them, counselors to them, friends to them, that they would find them, um, that no one would be journeying alone. And Our Lady, we ask for your prayers for us, Our Lady of Hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>